So the fisher sozin attack has been used very effectively as white against the Nash dwarf. As you can tell from the name fisher sozin, it was played by Fisher, also by a grandmaster named Sozin, but they popularized a opening that was played in the 1930s by another grandmaster. So it wasn't really popular, it wasn't used all that much until Fisher brought it back in the 70s and used it with great effect. And so the key move order that turns it into the Fisher Sozin is that on the sixth move, White plays the bishop out to c4 immediately. That makes it so the b5 move can't be played and stopping, stopping the bishop from, from moving out. Instead of playing f3 and going into the regular Yugoslav attack or English attack patterns, we're going to be playing against f7. Okay, so we'll just go through the move order really quickly again, just so you guys can, can see it, get really, really familiar with all the moves. Sicilian takes, takes. We say we're going to play the Nashdorf, and then they go fish yourself. Now, what this does is it usually it stops black from playing this e5 move now. Because if black plays e5, the knight can simply go back to f3, and now this bishop is aimed at, at f7, it's dangerous, and this bishop can't so easily come out, it would get traded and have a really ugly pawn doubling right here, and if b5, we just leave it back, it becomes a really important piece as part of an attack later on and this d5 Nashdorf setup has been weakened, basically. It just doesn't work as well anymore. So what tends to happen in order to refute this powerful bishop and not have any weaknesses in the position for black, instead of playing d or e5 here, they'll simply play e6 and transpose into a Shevardnadzian type of position, which we're going to learn a lot more about later in the course. And the Shevardnadzian is a really solid setup that has become less popular due to a couple of certain uh, attacking lines by White that, if your opponent knows really well, can be very dangerous. And of course, at the Grandmaster level, they all know all the themes and popular attacking lines against each defense. So what they're doing at the Grandmaster level, since they're also good at calculating and they're also well-read, is they're doing a lot of strategic decisions about which opening lines to play against which opponents, how to employ them, there's a lot of psychology going on there. Like when Bobby Fischer famously opened a game with the English opening, which he had never played before in his whole career as a chess player in serious competition, but of course, which he knew very well because he was a great grandmaster and studied all different types of chess positions. And so he used that against Grandmaster Spassky in the World Championship match, and it surprised Spassky because Fischer always opened with E4. Fisher once famous said E4 is best by test, the best opening. He didn't believe in playing a lot of D4 openings back in the day. And so Spassky wasn't as prepared to play uh, against Fisher in an English opening where the first move is white plays pawn C4. And Fisher played a really amazing game and defeated Spassky in decisive fashion. And Spassky even stood up and clapped because it was such an impressive display of positional chess. But the psychological impact of Fisher playing an opening that Spassky wasn't ready for, not that he didn't know it, Spassky had played that type of position probably thousands of times against other grandmasters, but he wasn't prepared to play that position against Fisher. And so it surprised him, and uh, who knows how much of a psychological impact it had, but it was one, one of the famous games from that World Championship match. Okay. So we, we basically, as black, if they put the fisher sozin, instead of playing the e5 move, we transpose into a Scheveningen. Now in the Scheveningen, you may or may not play a6. So basically what we have is a Scheveningen where a6 has been played. So this happens a lot when you're playing the Najdorf. And again, that's one of the, the reasons that Najdorf is popular. It's very flexible. I mean, you can even transpose into a dragon for the Najdorf. And it's not, there's no really point in playing a6 first if you plan to play the, the dragon, but depending on what your opponent does, if you decide that you want to, you can. Or maybe you want to play a6 first, so your, your opponent starts to set up like they're going to play against the Najdorf, and then we play the dragon instead. So there's lots of things you can do out of the Najdorf basic position. So in this case, once we play e6, now if white wants to go into their regular English attack setup, we simply 
set up in a very solid way here. We can knock this bishop back to b7, and we can we can either put our bishop on d7 and continue to defend this, or we can be in credo it on uh, b7. But it's usually a good idea to simply defend this pawn right here, and you're going to have a very defensive setup. Now, white still may go into the English attack here and do the same things that we've been seeing, but it's not as effective. It's similar to the Nashdor, only now, instead of this pawn being on e5, it's on e5, or on, on e6, excuse me. And so what this also allows us to do, it allows us to put our queen on d or c7 right here and defend from any pawn push that would open the board on e5. Notice that you can't play e5. We've got one, two, three pieces defending it. And if he wants to play this move immediately, it's no problem at all. We'll put him into that nice defensive position that we learned about before. And while it looks that white is, is getting a menacing attack, black has lots of options here. Again, we have this possible b5 to move this knight. We have the queen lined up against the king. We can, at any point, play knight to e5 and threaten to trade him off for this powerful bishop. One of the points of playing bishop to c4 in the fisher stones an attack is that's a good piece that's aimed down on f7 against the Najdor, which is why it makes a lot of sense for us to play e6 in response and play it against that bishop. We're nullifying something that's supposed to be a major strength for white in the position. Now, while this white knight is defending f3, it can't move. It has to continue to defend him. Okay, and if he wants to push this pawn down, it's fine. We'll go ahead and basically force this, this bishop to be traded. If he doesn't want to trade the white bishop and he just moves his queen, we can't move there because then we just take the bishop. He moves the queen over to here. Now we can trade off this other bishop, which is the major attacking piece in most English and Yugoslav attack openings because it forms a battery with the queen and can easily come down and attack. So either way, we would be getting a strategic win for black by trading off that knight for one of the bishops. Now we have achieved the famous advantage of having the bishop pair, right? It's usually better to have two bishops than for your opponent to have one bishop and two knights because the bishops can control both colored squares and you can do a lot of good with that. So basically, while black isn't necessarily winning in this position and white still may have and attack, it's much more difficult for white to attack, and for black, we are getting equalization with our own counter-attacking chances. Now, let's say we want to knock this knight back. If he moves over here to h3, we can trade it off, or we can just leave him there. That's fine. It doesn't really matter. We have the option of trading him. We can set up our pieces across from the king, and we have a good game here. He may continue to come down, and at this point, you'll just do a lot of calculating to see if the threat is real, what can we do to counterattack, look at all these different move orders and, and options, and just see what it is we can do. We might want to just open up the center at this point and trade, just depending on our calculations and what can happen. Okay, so we can even we can threaten this knight now because we've got two pieces attacking it. He'll have to move it somewhere. He's got nowhere to go. So it looks like his knight is trapped in the situation, actually. So we would have wanted to calculate that. So he can't go here, can't go here, we can take it, can't go back. So his knight would be trapped in the situation because our bishop can now take it. We would win a piece, okay? So he would have hopefully calculated that because we're, we're assuming we're playing against good chess players. So he would have to put his knight back here into a rough spot on the H file. Maybe he would just reroute it over here but well, we would have gained time, and now we can push our pawns and attack this bishop. See? So now black has nice counterattacking chances on our own. If he wants to take another move to go over here, we can basically force this bishop to be traded off. Actually, in this case, it would be trapped. See? And so that he's going to have to move one of these pawns in order to save his bishop, basically. So he'll do something like this. Let's say play a three, and now we are the ones that are drawing first blood and opening up the position on this side, and we can have a lot of threats now. We can make him go back here. We can move our rook over and aim 
doing here, set up some threats with the queen, and things like that. Okay, so lots of attacking chances we see for both sides, but if you are black playing against white in the Najdorf, and they play the Fischer Sozin attack, you generally do not want to go ahead and continue with e5, okay? You want to play e6, and you want to transpose into a really solid Chevenningen. This is this is basically, it started as a Najdorf, transposed into a Chevenningen, which is what you have when you have your pawns on d6 and on e6. And then with this pawn on a6, it restrains all their pieces, as we've seen in multiple different scenarios now, it allows for b5, it allows for very harmonious queenside expansion. And again, when you play the Sicilian defense, in almost all of the endgame scenarios that you'll end up in, if you don't mess your pawn structure up too much, you will have an advantage in the endgame because your pawn structure is usually better. White gets an early attacking chance typically, and if you can defend it, you get counterattacking chances, and or you will have a good end game when all the pieces are traded off. And so never be afraid to trade off the pieces and go into an end game when you're a Sicilian defense player. You'll get a lot of winning end game positions. And you just gotta be prepared for their pawn storm to, to come down and know how to defend it. Don't freak out, trade off some pieces and get your own momentum going on the queen side. This is a really typical example of something that you might see. And as always, make sure you're calculating deeply between each move. In chess, we don't want to make any assumptions, right? We don't assume our opponent's going to play the move that we think they're going to play. We have to calculate and make sure that we're playing forcing chess. Only moves that are forcing. And look at your opponent's best moves. Always try to find your opponent's absolute best move against you. It's one of the biggest weaknesses of lower level players is that you're looking for what you can do and you're not fully looking for what your opponent can do to you because it's not as fun to calculate all of your opponent's moves and play defense. But if you want to be a strong chess player, you have to do that. Look for their strongest moves just as actively as you would look for your strongest attacking moves and then you will be playing forcing chess and you will become a much stronger chess player.